All right, well, um, maybe we could get started here. Um, my name is Susan Eisenhower. I'm on the Board of Advisors of the Center for National Interest, and it's a great pleasure to be here today to introduce uh, uh, Adranik uh, uh, Migranyan. Uh, he is the <clears throat> director of the Institute for uh, Democracy and Cooperation. Um, he is a great friend of this uh, center, as we all know, and we're really very uh, delighted to have him with us today. He's just uh, back from Moscow, so he can give us some fresh perspectives on what the thinking is there in the Russian capital. Uh, if he grimaces or uh, gets a look of distress on his face, I'd like to point out that he's got some back pain at the moment. It's not necessarily the subject matter, <laughs> though that will be it for up to us to decide. Anyway, I'd like to give the floor to Adranik. Thank you, Susan. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was here last time in August. We discussed my lengthy article, which was on the national interest. But now, really, I was in Moscow. Then I traveled to Armenia and Georgia, and I met a lot of people over there. And I have some uh, fresh impressions how the situation is developing in Moscow. This is, I think, and uh, I, uh, I would like to be a kind of informal uh, conversation, uh, but I just would like to, uh, to say a, a couple of things before uh, starting our uh, dialogue. Uh, because uh, I think what, what is the most important thing which I found in Moscow uh, since I haven't been there for four or five months. Uh, the situation is uh, this, uh, about the president and the power in Moscow. Uh, there were some expectations that might be after Crimea and jo joining of Crimea to Russia, uh, after the beginning of this enthusiasm as a result of uh, this event, uh, and after imposition of sanctions, uh, this enthusiasm will decline uh, and there will be different kind of problems in elite groups among oligarchs, surroundings of Putin and between Putin and the population. But the reality is this. Uh, practically, uh, the Putin's rating is not only stable, it even increased during this uh, couple of months after sanctions. Uh, Elite groups are consolidated around Putin and practically some uh, naive uh, uh, assertions that uh, there could be a kind of oligarchic revolution or rebel against Putin. Uh, they didn't have, I never thought that this people who wrote about this kind of uh, possible developments, they didn't have any touch with reality, and reality is that really uh, elite groups also are consolidated and practically not even a trace uh, from anywhere to challenge the policy which a president is pursuing. The rating level is 87, which is unprecedented even higher than after Crimea uh, rejoining with Russia. And I don't see uh, any, uh, you know, in, in near future this 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 going to uh, keep the, 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 the same level will, will sustain. And what is another important thing, though economy is not in a good shape, and everybody, uh, I think, read the predictions about the development, the rate of the growth. Ulyukhaev's project, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, assessments and assessments of the Ministry of Economy and uh, Central Bank and others, really uh, there are something about 0.5% of growth which is expected this year or might be even less uh, or might be 1%, but this is not the problem. The problem is that unprecedentedly higher is the level of the trust of the people that Russia is on the right track. 62% of Russians are thinking that Russia is on the right track. In this country, I think the level is twice less, if I am correct, that America is on the right track. It, I am not uh, comparing this. I, I know that we are living in different environment, and peoples are different, but this shows that uh, Russian society is uh, consolidated, power institutions are consolidated, and president uh, is considered to be a very efficient leader, uh, enjoying unprecedented uh, support from society and uh, from different elite groups. Extremely marginalized is uh, Russian opposition, so-called non-system opposition, which once in uh, 2011, 10, especially 11 at the beginning 2012, was seen as a serious challenge to existing authorities. Uh, this shows that uh, attempts of our Western partners, and especially Washington, to isolate Russia and to punish Russia uh, still doesn't have any serious impact on society, and which means that uh, one must be very naive to expect any real changes in Russia's uh, policy line which is conducted by president. Second important thing is that uh, in Ukrainian direction also Russia achieved or at least one can estimate that Russia achieved uh, serious successes or at least one can perceive what's going on now in Ukraine as a serious defeat or serious loss of Kiev authorities. Uh, Poroshenko, all we remember when he became the president, he said that he is going to put an end this anti-terrorist operation for a couple of days or for a couple of weeks. And of course, he and other Ukrainian politicians were not ready to accept Lugansk and Donetsk republics or their leaders as uh, partners for negotiations. Today's reality is that practically Poroshenko was forced to sit at the table with these people and negotiate the status of these regions and interrelations between Kiev authorities and authorities over there. Which means if, uh, I remember the day when I was going to give my speech here uh, two months ago, I was calling to Moscow and asking the people, my friends, how is the situation in, in Lugansk and Donetsk, and they were in siege, and practically everybody was expecting that Donetsk is going to fall, Lugansk is going to fall, and practically total defeat of self-defense forces in east and south, now situation is radically changed, radically changed. And practically, if not President Putin, I think that self-defense forces 
could take over Mariupol. They could uh, move further into Dnepropetrovsk and even further to south in direction of Odessa. And practically recently, we witnessed new wave of a kind of serious mass demonstrations in Kharkov, in Odessa, in some other places, which means the situation, even in this sense, is radically changing in Ukraine. This is happening without direct invasion of Russia and Russian troops into south and east of Ukraine. As a result, recently, Ukrainian Rada passed uh, the law about special status of some areas of Lugansk and Donetsk republics. And which practically created serious internal tension in Kiev. Uh, many politicians who are now involved in electoral process are blaming Poroshenko that this is a serious defeat of Poroshenko. This, this is the betrayal of Ukrainian statehood and all these kind of blames they are using against Poroshenko. But the truth is that practically Ukrainian army totally was collapsed as a result of all these warfare on south and east, losing all the armament, losing a lot of people uh, as uh, prisoners or uh, being uh, captured by self-defense forces, and uh, practically if not the truce and a ceasefire, then uh, the fate of Poroshenko in Kiev could be under the, uh, you know, question what's going to happen with him because further losses could uh, bring the collapse of the power over there and the increase of the influence of radical forces over there. I would like to. Uh, I'm um, I, I don't want to, to speak too much, uh, but how long yeah, I am speaking? No, yet? Ten minutes. Yeah. Already. Okay. I I would like to uh, 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 summarize what I said. Uh, the problem is that Russia is filling the sanctions. Uh, sanctions are unpleasant, but. These are not the sanctions which can, uh, you know, force Russia to change the policy, especially, as I said, uh, because in Ukraine, situation is in favor of self-defense forces, and Russia's aim vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine is not changed, and Russia would like to know what is a Western partner's aim uh, uh, in relation of Ukraine and in relation of Russia, because uh, this is uh, the problem which th this is a kind of uh, uh, Russian people. I'm not talking about uh, the politicians, but Russian people are a bit puzzled. And I would like just to uh, say a couple of words about uh, the notion that in Russia there is uh, the rise of anti-Americanism. In reality, this is not the rise of anti-Americanism, but this is a lack of understanding what are the motives of America in this conflict. Because for average Russians, situation in Ukraine is something as a family affair, which has nothing to do neither with Germany nor with the United States, Washington, or Brussels, because uh, the <coughs> problem is that uh, Crimea, once against even Soviet laws, were transferred to uh, Ukraine from Russia. And now, according to will of the people, uh, the Crimea returned back to Russia. What a big deal. Whose problem is this? Why such a noise around this? 
the Russian people don't understand this. They think that this is a fair thing which happened and everybody must be supportive to this. Second problem is that uh, Russians in Ukraine want to speak Russian. What is the problem? Every day uh, people listen that 7% of Swedes in Finland they enjoy the right to have second state language over there. What happened? Why 7% uh, Swedes can have this opportunity and I don't know 10 million or about 9, 10 million Russians and 70% of Ukrainians whose mother tongue was Russian, who speak Russian, they can't have this kind of right. Which means there are several things which is unexplainable and Russian public doesn't understand it. Which means this is the reason why there is not the idea of anti-Americanism, but, but this is the idea of, uh, this is not against American public because American public at large uh, don't know about Ukraine anything, even can't find on the map where is the, this country, which is fine, but American leadership that's why there is an idea that might be there are some uh, some uh, different kind of ideas in Washington against Russia. That's why the sanctions are not motivated by Ukrainian events, but something uh, bigger is behind this, which is quite a possible. I wrote about that lengthy. Many others wrote about this. This is the problems of global geopolitics, uh, global strategic interests of U.S., uh, Russia's place in this uh, global geopolitics, which is uh, under the discussions uh, in Russian media all these several months. Which means I would like to stop here and to say that Russian leadership is open for cooperation with uh, United States on many issues. And the last thing which I would like to say, I met during this visit with Evgeny Primakov, mm -hmm. and he said one funny thing to me. He said, listen, if uh, there was not the crisis uh, in Ukraine and this tension between Washington and Moscow, whom do you think Washington would address first in order to deal with ISIL? Uh, problem in Iraq and Syria. I'm sure that Moscow will, could be the first to whom America would address in order to cooperate in dealing with this problem, which means these kind of problems are many in other places, and which means Russian leaders are uh, demonstratively uh, leaving the door open for any kind of uh, cooperation with the United States, though understanding that these sanctions will last might be a long time, and understanding that really might be Russia, um, American uh, establishment has a uh, long-term uh, ideas and strategies about the Russia, which is incompatible with Russia's national interest and Russia's perception about their place in, in this new world <coughs> configuration in international relations. Yeah, I would uh, stop here. Uh, sorry that no. I might be overused. Not, not at all. Um, um, Andronik, you had many, many interesting points there. Um, we can now open this up for discussion. Do we have any uh, questions? If so, please raise your hand, maybe introduce yourself. Okay. Yes, thanks. Anton Piyashin, American University um, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Ms. Mijayan, I'd like to go back to something you mentioned about Muri Ubud um, and about the fact that had it not been for letting us within the, the forces, the, re the rebels may have taken the city. Um, that reflects something that, oh, thank you, that um, uh, a realization that is emerging in the Western press that uh, instead of being the chief aggressor, Putin has actually been a break on much more hawkish forces in Moscow. Can you speak a little bit about uh, that uh, part of the Russian political establishment, who they are and what interests they are pursuing and how Putin is attempting to uh, uh, to hold them back? Thank you. Yeah, it's not a secret that uh, among Russian elite groups and public 
uh, and among intellectuals, uh, there are supporters of the idea that uh, this is the beginning of Russian spring. Russia is a divided nation. Russians are in different places in former Soviet space, and it's necessary to return them back into Russia, either directly joining these territories with Russia or just uh, trying to establish closer relations with them. And this uh, people are on television, they are on media, and you know the names. Uh, a couple of them were demonized like Dugin, or Prakhanov, and some others. But uh, in political circles also are the people who uh, who are called as Silaviki, or uh, the people who represent the force uh, structures uh, that in case uh, to prevent any further advancement of uh, NATO uh, closer to Russian borders, uh, it's necessary to use uh, the weakness and practical collapse of Ukraine as a state in order to advance as further as it's possible in order uh, not to let you know, to the realization of the ideas of further uh, involvement of Ukraine into NATO. Uh, this is seriously discussed on every level because this is a real threat for Russia, and Russia doesn't want, especially when this kind of provocative actions are happening, like Yatsenyuk's proposal to lift uh, uh, this. Uh, non-bloc uh, status of Ukraine and to uh, become a privileged partner of the United States or uh, to be a member of NATO uh, structures. Which means this, and, and, uh, and in reality, uh, Putin uh, might be, uh, is one of the uh, major factors on the way of these forces who are very much in favor of immediate invasion and immediate seizure of all these territories over there. And by the way, this is openly articulated in Russian media. Practically all leaders of parties which are represented in Russian parliament, they are demanding recognition of these uh, two republics, and they are demanding massive uh, use of force in that territories and realization of the program of Novorossiya, if not all the Ukraine without Galicina. Uh, these are very far going aims of many political uh, forces, but Putin is, of course, a very realistic and sober politician. He, uh, thank God, is controlling the situation in Moscow and uh, is trying to maneuver in order, as I said, leaving the door open for a serious deal with Washington uh, because practically it's a waste of time to deal with Kiev or to deal with any others because they are totally dependent and the only patron of these forces in Kyiv is Washington, or at least Moscow perceived this this way, and especially when some uh, leading members of this administration are proving every day with their statements, as Vice President Biden recently said, yeah, Europe is reluctant to impose sanctions, but we practically made a pressure on them, and after that, Europe had to uh, impose sanctions. Uh, I like uh, Biden. He is an open-minded uh, person. He is, <laughs> you know, uh, telling us the truth, and we like it. Uh, which means, uh, but this is—it's called in Latin sancta simplicity. Yeah, 
<laughs> which means we, we can use this in our policy and propaganda. Uh, everybody is surprised that in, in, in Russia there are some anti-American sentiments. If American vice president is telling them that uh, they forced Europeans to impose sanctions, uh, I don't think that one can expect that the uh, Russian public will be very enthusiastic and happy about that. Th this is quite normal, this negative reaction to this. We've got a question back there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mike Pesner with the Senate Intelligence Committee. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Mike Pesner with the Senate Intelligence Committee. Thank you very much for, for doing this. Um, on this issue, I wonder uh, uh, if you might be able to um, dispel this admittedly imperfect analogy uh, but I think this is the cause of some of the concern in the West. You have a, a nation that has gone through near economic collapse, uh, large inflation where people have lost their savings through no fault of their own, a huge loss of territory, uh, not through a, a defeat in a war, but uh, uh, nonetheless a significant loss of territory. Uh, uh, with Russian speakers, or uh, sorry, the analogy is with with German speakers, uh, it's been disarmed. Uh, there is increasing control of the domestic population and the sources of propaganda, and the initial demand is just to regain the territory that was uh, uh, lost in this war through no fault of the German people with German speakers. It, that's the analogy. It's imperfect to today's uh, situation between Russia and Ukraine, but I think the worry is if Mr. Putin's policy is not stopped in Ukraine, what is the next target or targets? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for this question. It's a good question, but you know, analogy is absolutely irrelevant because uh, many times uh, not only me, but many serious analysts in this country and uh, even Russian leaders several times mentioned that if uh, our Western partners met some uh, very important demands uh, of Russia vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and vis-a-vis post-Soviet space, nothing could happen which happened in Ukraine during this half a year. And uh, what, what I mean, if uh, our Western partners kept to the, got stuck to the agreements made by Gorbachev and uh, American leaders, Bush elder, Baker and uh, Soviet foreign ministers, not enlarging NATO on eastward, not involving uh, not only Eastern European countries, but even former Soviet republics into NATO, not uh, trying to change uh, the geopolitics over there, nothing could happen. Russia could feel itself very safe and secure, and Russia wouldn't have any idea grabbing uh, Crimea or eastern part of Ukraine or even Ukraine, which means uh, this is not Russia's initiative, this is not Russia's policy by choice, but this is uh, Russia, Russia is forced to, 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 to go for some steps which otherwise Russia would not do in any case. And I was a senior advisor to Supreme Soviet of Russian Federation in 92-93, and I remember that Crimeans were always in uh, Supreme Soviet at that time demanding Russia's actions in order to return back to Crimea. Never ever we were thinking that it is possible. Even when Russian party won the elections, and Meshkov became the president under the slogans of rejoining Crimea with Russia, and parliament was totally dominated by 
pro-Russian forces in, Cry in Crimea, yeah. And nobody wanted to do that because Russia uh, at that time perceived Ukraine as a friendly country, as a non-bloc country, because the Declaration of Independence of Ukraine has this idea of non-bloc status. By the way, Charlie, who is now deputy uh, head of uh, administration, he once was at the seminar here, if you remember, former deputy foreign minister, he was at that time pursuing uh, that we don't need any block status, we need to be out of blocks, we need to be ne neutral. And in this uh, case, Russia didn't have any problems. But when uh, Bush Jr.'s administration uh, was interested in inviting Ukraine and Georgia into NATO, all these processes started at that time. And by the way, Ukrainians and some uh, Ukrainian uh, mentors were offended when Putin in Bucharest said that don't do that with Ukraine because Ukraine is not yet uh, a, real a real country. Because, and I was in Kiev in September and by the way, Poroshenko and many others, uh, Litvin and politicians, oligarchs, uh, attending the club session. There was a club, Skavarada, which was running uh, Dmitry Kiselyov. And I was the speaker and I said, listen, you have a very fragile country. You are pushing this uh, in one direction or another direction. You are risking to destroy your country because uh, the only possibility to keep the country together is this very cautious line which was pursued by Kravchuk and Kuchma all the time, you know, maneuvering between Moscow and uh, Brussels, between Moscow and Washington, and not making uh, this kind of radical shifts in one or other direction. And reality, that, rea and reality that happened because and this was clear for us that any radicals who could come to power, they'll destroy their country, which means this is not Russia's choice. This is not Russia's initiative. Russia would like to have, uh, you know, uh, more clear relations with the Ukraine, but clear relations in a global context vis-a-vis -vis Washington and Brussels. And as, I, as once I formulated here many times, the Russian position is very clear. Russian language as a second language, non-bloc status, and federalization of Ukraine. And that's it. Yes. Thanks, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. I wanted to probe a little bit more about to what extent uh, it's possible to isolate the Ukraine crisis from Russia's other policies. Uh, particularly, you mentioned that Primakov said Russia could be more helpful against I, uh, Islamic State. Uh, the Iran talks, uh, as you know, are not proceeding as quickly as some would like. Uh, there have been suggestions that Russia is going to cut its own deals with Iran if there is no agreement at the end of November. Uh, I just wanted, wondered if that came up at all in your conversations with them, and if you can give us any idea of whether Russia is prepared to uh, be a sanctions buster with Iran if the crisis over Ukraine continues and there's no uh, nuclear deal with the Iranians. Uh, let's be realistic. I don't think that Russia will do anything in order to ease the problems in this area, if Russia in its attempts to uh, make concessions is getting more and more sanctions. Again, the ball is in Washington's court. Washington wanted Putin to negotiate with Poroshenko. Putin negotiated with Poroshenko and we got new portion of sanctions. Washington wanted ceasefire, Russia forced or used its influence 
over self-defense forces uh, to uh, to go for this ceasefire and to stop advancement in Mariupol in other places. After that, Russia got another portion of sanctions. Recently, uh, self-defense forces took over the airport in Donetsk. And again, we heard uh, the threats that it's going to be a new round of sanctions, which means uh, we don't understand the message from Washington. When these sanctions will stop, when these sanctions would be repealed, and in what cases Russia could be... By the way, uh, coming back to Iran, which is uh, very important, we talked this with Primakov and I talked about this with uh, some others. Uh, one result is now evident concerning Iran. Russia already signed with Iran agreement uh, food for oil, yeah, which means this gonna uh, increase room for maneuver for Iran, which means, and Russia will not go further in strengthening the sanctions, but as Tom Graham in this, uh, uh, this is the book, or what is this? Uh, some report. It's it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is men mentioning a couple of things that yeah, uh, short term goal of America is to create problems for Russian oligarchs, Russian economy. Medium term, to weaken Russia in order not let Russia to project power outside of Russian Federation and long-term goal is to, uh, to, yeah, to regime change in Russia and in security sense to, uh, to go further in development of anti-missile defense and uh, then to use uh, American shale gas and American oil in order to kick out Russia from Europe, from other markets, and to use even, it's very funny, to use even Iran, which is the holder of the richest resources of gas and oil, in order to substitute Russian oil and gas by Iranian oil and gas. But, you know, it's very naive uh, for us, because unfortunately nobody wrote about possible Russian reactions to all these things. Uh, might be. Yeah. Did, he did that? Yeah, I haven't. Uh, yeah, it was too long. Usually I, I read Lukianov's pieces, but, it's, but they are usually very banal. Not, not, something, <laughs> not something stupid, but something very. very good paper. Which, uh, which is very. It's, it's very good. I, I like Lukianov, but unfortunately he's writing too much to, 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 to write something deep and profound. Yeah. Uh, but, but again, uh, the problem is that Iran, of course, uh, is very important factor. And uh, I read in American uh, press and analytical circles some estimations that America can achieve some kind of uh, result in American-Iranian uh, relations, and this could be a breakthrough which could decrease the role of Russia, and Russia is not going to be uh, a country uh, from which is dependent American-Iranian relations or Israeli-Iranian relations or the problems in the region. This could be a kind of separate venue, uh, you know, between two countries. But it's, again, I've been many times in Iran. I talked, uh, especially in a period when there were very high expectations when Khatami came to power. Not Rouhani, but Khatami. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the potential of American-Iranian relations are very limited. Any uh, Iranian government is limited in its options uh, dealing with America.
And it's, uh, it's very naive to think that uh, Washington can play Iran against Russia and kick out Russia from different markets using Iran. Uh, in Iran, everybody understands that the aim of uh, Washington is regime change over there, nothing less. And uh, they can't go too far in their actions, risking to damage and spoil Iranian-Russian relations in order to get some mythical American, uh, you know, vote, I don't know. Because nothing less, first, it's hard to sell to Iranian public this kind of radical changes <coughs> in policy. And in this country also, it's hard to sell to American public a closer cooperation with Iran without regime change in that country. At least this is my reading of the situation, and we in Moscow are following very thoroughly uh, what's going on in American-Iranian relations and what is the place of Iran and other countries. But in this sense, again, we feel that Russia is indispensable partner for America in the region. Dimitri. Uh, uh, this uh, food for fuel swap is not going anywhere, though, until we know what happens with the nuclear talks. Uh, you know, I... It would violate sanctions. Uh, sorry? It would, it would violate sanctions as they're currently written. Uh, food for fuel, even though it's barter, it would violate sanctions. Uh, I... Uh, <laughs> At, at least in Russia, nobody uh, says uh, this way uh, the deal, because the deal was already preliminary signed, and it is not yet uh, implemented. But at least I never, uh, I, I haven't read anything that there are some obstacles. In uh, case of further sanctions against Russia. I think Russia can't even get out of the sanctioned regime against Iran. Dmitry? When you are under the sanction, it's very stupid to impose sanctions against the others who are also under the sanctions of the country <coughs> which is sanctioning you. Uh, I have actually a comment, a question uh, I also do hear from uh, some Russian politicians, our mutual acquaintances in Moscow, that they are even considering legislation which would not uh, allow Russia uh, to uh, support a any sanctions as long as they are introduced by countries uh, that are uh, uh, imposing sanctions on Russia. I don't know uh, what the language should be and whether it would address sanctions that are already in place or just new sanctions. But there is clearly a discussion in that direction. But that raises a question in my mind. And I want uh, uh, to follow what Mr. Fidyashin has said. It's not clear to many of us as we are watching Russian foreign policy discussion, particularly as we are watching uh, talk shows on Russian TV. Who are the people who are making these very radical suggestions going all the way to Odessa taking over Mariupol, uh, the whole Ukraine <coughs> is going to be liberated by the insurgents, and etc., and etc. Uh, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, we hear statements like that from all representatives of uh, uh, Russian political parties that are currently uh, in the parliament. And what's remarkable about that that these suggestions are made by representatives of Mr. Yeltsin, sorry, of Mr. Putin's own United Russia Party. So <coughs> one kind of uh, thinks that uh, uh, the Russian president has some influence over that party. You said that <coughs> Putin has stopped the insurgents' offensive uh, 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 against Mariupol, but uh, representatives of the insurgents also are saying that they were able to proceed with this offensive because they're getting help from Moscow. You, you have seen these programs. They are not saying that there is any Russian direct military presence, but they are making clear on Russian TV that they are receiving considerable assistance. And Mr. Zakharchenko, who is a leader in Donetsk, even said that he has so-called Russian volunteers 
who are regular military officers, Russian, but who happen to be on vacation. And so, as you can imagine, it creates some confusion about this kind of a radical voice in Russia and to what extent it is used by the government as a propaganda tool. Uh, that's a good question, and I think that uh, it might be good or bad, but in Russia we have now uh, a leader who is making the decisions, and on him uh, hardly there are not serious forces who can make an impact on his decision-making process. But at the same time, I think for Putin it is, uh, it is good, as for every politician, to have a, co uh, uh, a different kind of voices in society and in political circles, because it leaves him his hands free and all options on the table, which means uh, society must be ready for every kind of development. And this is, uh, I think, might be the aim of Russian propaganda machine, which you see on Russian television, that you can stop the processes, you can cut the deal on peace, but you can even advance up to Galicina or even further. Though, of course, it is very... Uh, but, but again, uh, for, I think for, for Putin this is very important because he is trying to have his bargaining positions stronger uh, dealing with Washington or uh, Berlin or Brussels, uh, because from position of weakness, nobody is going to deal with Russia. You must have something which you can, you know, uh, exchange with something. I have seen you being accused on Russian TV of being naive about the United States and being a kind of a, a support of appeasement, which would come with news to most of us who know you in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I want to understand, people who say this on Russian TV, are they for real? Do they have influence? Or is this just, again, a propaganda technique? Uh, I think, because I know them all personally, that's why I can tell you absolutely, uh, frankly, and clearly. There are two no, three types of people who are talking on this issue. Some are idiots and they are absolutely uh, true believers that they have to do this and nothing else. This is Russian spring, Russia must, you know, invade, Russia must conquer, Russia must take, and some American and Western uh, journalists even raised the names of these guys as the ideologues of Putin and ideologues of new Putin policy, as I said, like Dugin, like Prakhana, like others. But these are myth creators. And the, I can't say they are honest people, they are idealists, they, they are thinking about, as, uh, as Prakhana is writing, Fifth Empire, uh, Dogen is writing something about all his fantasies. They have zero impact on real political decision-making process, but they are very important for public uh, in in public dimension. You have to have you have this kind of crazy people in your country a lot. Uh, really? And I don't want to <laughs> mention the names, but <laughs> but you have them uh, in Congress, in Senate, in many other places. Uh, second group, uh, they are uh, political opportunists, and I know them 
also very well. And even uh, several names, you know them very well too. They think that in public, uh, this is the time when you have to formulate this way the position of Russia. It doesn't mean that this is the position of uh, Russian leadership and anybody is going to make this kind of decisions, but this is a right direction at least to speak in public dimension. By the way, during the last, the, the last now, now at least it might be my friend Fadeev got a program on Channel First for, as he formulated that yesterday talking to me, this is for intelligent people, which means you have to look at that program but too. You but he invited, <laughs> yeah. But we, uh, yeah, I criticized him, he agreed with me, but this, this he said for rating. But, but, but what is the problem? Uh, and uh, I would like to bring one uh, example. Uh, Vyacheslav Nikonov was on the program and he was asked, listen, giving interview to one of the uh, German? Ger German, yeah, on, on education. And he was asked, what could be the reaction of your grandfather uh, during this crisis if it happened when he was in charge? And his answer, I haven't read that, uh, he, he, he said that uh, it took him a month or a week to completely, you know, grab Ukraine and solve all the problems. And when he was asked, is this really your position? He became a little bit afraid because he was asked in another way, do you know that this contradicts the position of President Putin at this moment? <laughs> to invade and to capture all the Ukraine? He said, no, no, no military solution of the problem. It doesn't mean that I, I am, uh, you know, proposing the invasion. I am just, uh, I, I just was uh, t talking about that period when communists were in power and my grandfather was there and might be he forgot to say that Joseph Stalin was there and he could make the decision <laughs> and his grandfather could implement the decision, otherwise he couldn't survive. Anyway, they, but these are smart guys who are formulating different kind of things. But there are a couple of others who really uh, feel at least uh, what what's gonna happen in reality because uh, practically only a small circle and uh, practically might be even in many cases uh, President Putin himself is making the final decision and knowing him at least during last 15 years following his decisions on foreign policy issues, uh, he is very sober, very pragmatic, and very cautious, and he is calculating uh, the results of all his actions. And I think, not in Russia, but some uh, political commentator here formulated this that he is playing the chess and Obama is playing marbles. We have a question over here. Uh, Ray Sontag from the Center for the National Interest. Um, so you mentioned that Russia has three clear, simple goals for Ukraine, and that's federalization, non bloc status, and protection of the Russian language. So what is Russia prepared to do to, to realize those goals? What is it prepared to do in Ukraine to make sure that happens? And if it doesn't happen, what will Russia do? Russia already is doing. Ukraine is, uh, Ukraine is practically at the edge of the collapse. I don't think that... But, well, of course Russia has every opportunity to accelerate the process. Ukraine is in chaos and Russia's uh, option is either to stimulate the chaos or to solve the chaos. Russia. But by the way, um, 
uh, in so Moscow, is R- Russia <laughs> is <laughs> not is not helping to solve the chaos, okay. unless you cr- Kiev authorities they are ready to come to a compromise and take serious Russia's interests. This is exactly what is happening. And by the way, uh, Poroshenko practically accepted on a limited uh, area every Russian interest. In these limited areas in Donetsk and Lugansk, all these things are there. Uh, practically self-government, they have. They are only symbolically. Oh, because it's too small uh, territory. Russia needs this kind of decisions made for all Ukraine, not only for these two small regions. This is the problem. And if Poroshenko started to make these concessions, you have to go up to the end. Why stop there? If it's a good thing to do, you have to do that in all other areas also. Got a question here. As is often the case in these things, the devil is in the details. And you, I think, very accurately portray that Russia is looking for federalization of Ukraine. Federalization means a lot of different things in a lot of different places in the world. So I wonder if you could define a little bit more specifically what Russia is specifically looking for in terms of federalization in Ukraine. And then a second question, if I might. I have been speaking to a lot of people in this town over the course of this week, and the signal that I've been getting very strongly is that this administration is absolutely open to a dialogue with the leadership in Russia, and in fact has been seeking a dialogue with the leadership in Russia, and has not succeeded in in achieving that. So I'm wondering what you think needs to be done if both sides are looking for a dialogue. What needs to be done in order to make that occur? Thank you, Peter. You know, I, I... I remember that all the time I was thinking that something very important I skipped, and now you reminded it. <laughs> it is important. Unfortunately, yeah, it is very important. Unfortunately, for a very sad occasion, I had to uh, to fly to San Diego last week, and after that, on my way back, I uh, stayed for two days in Los Angeles. And ha- I, I was uh, lucky, and I think I had to do that earlier, I visited Reagan's library. And, you know, what struck me, but then I read that, I think, Dimitri, in your article might be, I didn't know that, uh, that Reagan, being so anti-communist, uh, threatening to to kick Soviet Union in the trash bag and to destroy, come to do all this evil empire and all these things, I was amazed when I uh, saw the picture of Reagan writing letter to Brezhnev. It's a famous and well-known fact, but I didn't know that that he was writing letter to, and Brezhnev ignored the letter. You know, I think. Since since summer, uh, a couple of times in your articles, Dimitri, with Paul, and even separately, you were writing. This is exactly answer to your question. You were writing that there is no need to cancel summit in Moscow. There is a necessity, urgent necessity, for personal meeting between Putin and Obama. If Reagan was ready to meet with Brezhnev, and Soviet Union and Soviet Union leader was existential threat for this country, Putin was and still thinks that he could be a good partner for America, but no initiative on behalf of Washington. I don't know with whom you are talking, but we didn't get any message except canceling the summit in Moscow. In some uh, and by but but of course on sidelines, Obama had to meet with Putin in order to solve the chemical weapons problem in Syria. But again, at this moment, 
not new portion or round of sanctions Russia needs from Washington. Really, we need a summit between our leaders. But I am not sure that Obama politically is in a position to meet with Putin and he can offer anything to Putin. It's a pity, but this is my reading of internal political situation in this city and in this country. Ahead of you, in a month, you will have uh, midterm elections. Political, political base of Obama is very narrow. Uh, the rating is declining. Uh, can you believe uh, what kind of talk could be between Putin, who has rating 87%, and Obama 40 or something like that? And he, he doesn't have any real agenda, any real proposal, except, you know, attempts to insult Putin personally and Russia personally. Unfortunately, during the last several times, when American president talked about Russia, it was an impression in Moscow that his sole aim was to insult. And even as Mark Adamanis mentioned, in one sentence he made three uh, big mistakes concerning Russia. That who needs Russia? Who goes to Russia? And Adamanis mentioned that after the United States, the largest illegal uh, immigrants are in Russia. And he said, might be American president doesn't know that not all these people from Guatemala, Honduras and others are coming not to Silicon Valley. They are coming to construction workers, to, you know, to service people in hotels, in other places, not everybody. And second, life expectancy, he said, for male population in Russia is 60 in case when it's 65. And the third one, that this is a declining and dying population in case when, since uh, 2009, five years in a row, there is increase of population, which shows that he doesn't have interest in Russia, and his advisors and uh, aides either are, uh, I don't know, also they don't have, though they are paid for that, I, I hope, to give uh, clear and proper information about the country uh, uh, when he is talking about this country. That's why I, we don't get any message that anybody in this city wants really to talk with Russia, what Russia wants. And I don't think that there is a necessity to talk to Kiev or even though yeah, Angela Merkel, Germany is an important country, but in Kiev, nobody cares about Germany. In Kiev, authorities are listening to Washington. Washington upcom is the most important upcom for them. Upcom is party committee. Party committee, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have another question back there. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh federalization, federal oh, right. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I, uh, Peter, it's, uh, uh, this uh, was widely discussed in Russian uh, media, and I was part of many conferences between Ukrainians and Russians when we, w we discussed this problem. It's very clear. Uh, even not more than American type of federalization, which means direct elections of governors, uh, local budget independent from federal budget, and uh, opportunity to have uh, close relations and trade and economic relations with neighboring, uh, you know, countries, which means with neighboring Russian regions, which are over there. And by the way, we had all these uh, agreements between Ukraine and Russia in previous periods about kind of border trade and border activities, and uh, this these are very minimal, uh, you know, demands on federalization, nothing more. But what is important, and Ukrainian politicians practically saying this, they are proving the statement once made by Putin. They usually tell that 
federalization means collapse of Ukraine as a state, which means it's not a normal state. It's an artificial construction. If federalization will bring to the collapse of the country. And this is exactly what their leaders are telling in Kiev. That's why no federalization. Thank you. Um, given what you've outlined, and specifically the political pressures, uh, both in Russia, where uh, I think it'll be very difficult to walk back any of the actions that have been taken specifically on Crimea, as well as in eastern Ukraine, and the political support that the president has. Uh, but also here, I think it's no secret that uh, there's no real downside on the Hill to uh, being the most anti-Russian. There's no constituency here uh, uh, for rapprochement. Um, and the articles that I'm sure you've seen that President Obama has essentially decided to try to get through the rest of his term to the maximum extent, ignoring uh, Mr. Putin uh, and, and cutting him out of any kind of geopolitical calculus. So, Given that, given the fact that um, for better or worse, uh, to the extent that there was a debate about NATO expansion uh, when people were paying attention to it, um, th there was a debate. Now, after the events in Ukraine, it's pretty clear that those who saw uh, this as a mistake that would bring uh, a new Cold War, uh, it's very difficult for them to make that argument because those that said we have to bring down the shield of security on Eastern Europe uh, can make the argument that they were proven correct. Uh, so, so given all of these factors, what do you have a recommendation for how to stop and maybe reverse this trend of confrontation that we are on because there doesn't seem to be any constituency to do so? Thanks. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, I, I like this kind of questions because this shows a constructive and pragmatic approach to the situation. Yeah, we know that you don't have in America a big constituency which is interested in rapprochement with uh, Russia. But what is important, I think, is this in America's interest to have confrontation with Russia? Russia doesn't want the confrontation. But is this, is Ukrainian situation worth, does it worth the spoiling the relations? Uh, to paying the price, shouldering the problems of enormous number of failed or almost failed states all over the globe when you have so many other problems inside and outside. We think in Moscow that it's not in America's interest. But I think that uh, it is uh, the problem of Washington to realize. But it takes time. You know, when you started the war against Iraq, everybody was supportive to that war, including Hillary Clinton. It takes 10 years or no, a bit less, six or I don't know, trillions of wasted money, thousands killed, until everybody realized that that was a serious mistake. Who knows, might be, this will take time to understand that America is wasting money, not gaining anything, and America is forcing Russia to create more and more problems on this way. Otherwise, uh, it's not, uh, you know, one side game. You are, uh, you, you are creating problems and expecting that your adversary is going to uh, put another cheek uh, for a slap. It's not going to happen. Retaliation could be, I'm sure, but it's not neither, it's not neither in Russian interest nor in American. At least we don't see any American interest in this tension and confrontation. I think we have time at, for one. At, at, there is no rational. At, at least I, I can see that, though all my life I am in international relations and politics. I don't see any rational of America's 
anti-Russian policy, which is now going on. We have, uh, actually, this is going to be the final question um, right here. Thank you. Thank you. Anya Shmeman, American University. You suggested that Russia would be open to a solution that included federalization, uh, self-government, autonomy, uh, language rights. But it seems that the rebels want more than that. They want independence. They want to secede. Um, so I wonder how Russia could use its influence uh, over the rebels. Y you said, you know, Moscow thinks that Kiev listens to Washington. And Washington, they think Donetsk listens to Moscow. Uh, so how, how can the uh, rebels, I will call them that, um, be persuaded to stand down? Oh, you know, this is exactly the question which I was in Seliger after our talks. Uh, Sergey Lavrov just returned back from uh, Minsk, uh, where contact group was a meeting on Ukraine, and he get exactly he got exactly the same question which you now asked me: uh, How you can say uh, keeping uh, territorial integrity of Ukraine when? Uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, they don't recognize uh, the Kiev and they want independence. Uh, Lavrov's um, answer, uh, I'll, I'll repeat his answer and then uh, comment on that. He said, oh, you know, that's why our position is let Kiev authorities to sit together with these people from east and south and discuss the problems and in a process they can come to a kind of solution. If Kiev would be ready to give really all this, uh, uh, make these concessions about devaluation of power from center to regions, uh, really fix the language uh, and non-block status, might be in this case uh, these regions could be uh, ready to be inside that kind of Ukraine. And Moscow's position is clear, and I think uh, Putin sent a very clear message, even two messages. First, when he said, if you remember, at the beginning of the process of referendum in Lugansk and Donetsk, he said, I would like you to postpone, not to organize the referendum, but they went forward and organized the referendum, and second, Russia didn't recognize these republics. Though, by the way, on every Russian TV show, the leaders of the parliamentary party groups are demanding recognition of these republics by Russian government. Russian government is not doing that, and Russia many, many times clearly formulated its position that Russia prefers federalized Ukraine rather than split it into several parts of Ukraine. Do you have any concluding remarks? Uh, Three minutes? No, I think that I already said a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just, really, I would like to, I never ever read, if you can do me a favor and mention even one publication where really is formulated not in a crazy way but in a normal rational way what is the uh, ultima ratio what is the reason that of American policy in Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis Russia we don't understand that it's just uh, again to put Russia under the control as it was in 90s, not let Russia to be sovereign and independent actor in world politics. This is the ultimate goal, or what is the ultimate goal? We don't, we don't understand that. 